We're still working with this Bach two-part invention. In the last talk, we orchestrated it for a string orchestra, much as the type of orchestra that Bach might have had. And now we're going to go one stage further with what I call a Haydn orchestra, which isn't quite fair, uh, because of course Haydn used many different sizes of orchestra, but very typical for this period, we're talking about 1770, is an orchestra with two oboes, one or two bassoons, and two horns, plus the strings that we've already been dealing with. Now, the string parts we don't need to change. They can stay exactly as they were for the Bach orchestra, but we have to talk about these newcomers. The uh, oboes can play much the same as the violins, but they are limited a little in their range. The lowest note is this D above middle C, and the highest, the D two octaves above. Now, of course, the oboe can go quite a bit beyond these, but this is the area that the composers of this time were usually using. Hmm? Uh, the bassoons are very seldom mentioned in the scores. There's a wonderful example of this in the Farewell Symphony. You'll notice that the bassoon isn't mentioned at all until the last few bars, when he suddenly has a few solo passages to play just before he puffs out his candle. And um, nobody's going to suggest, of course, that the bassoon would have done nothing all the time. Uh, he was obviously playing just with the bass line. And the composers of this period would just write basso for all of the bass group. And sometimes there's some discussion about who actually was really playing at this time. But the bass group consisted of bassoons, cellos, basses, and of course the harpsichord. And the harpsichord would still have been present with Haydn's orchestra for most of the time. But we shall have to take some time to consider Haydn's horns, because of course the instruments he was writing for didn't have valves. This meant that they could only play the notes of the harmonic series. Now if we take basically the highest, I mean there were sometimes horns in D, but if we take the highest of these, which is the high horn in C, its lowest fundamental note is the C, which is the bottom C of the cello, the bottom C of the organ. All right? this, uh, this fundamental is actually unplayable, but this is where we calculate our notes from, because the notes that we need are the second octave of the harmonic series, the third octave of the harmonic series, you will remember this from our talk in the, uh, in the very, actually the very first talk, wasn't it? And then we have the notes of the major scale in the fourth octave. Now, obviously that note is far too high for any horn player to play, so that what we also must consider is not only which transposition we are using to know which notes are available, but also we have a sort of limit around this high C, Above this, no horn player should, ask, should be really be asked to play, although Haydn, again, does actually do that. Yeah? So, we have the various transpositions of the horn. Because of the horn was so limited with the number of notes it could play, uh, composers used to write in the key of whatever they were writing. If it were in F major, well, they would choose horns in F, so that they would have the maximum number of notes available. Uh, somewhat problematic is, of course, pieces in a minor key, and what people would tend to do there would be take, to take two pairs of horns and have one in the major key, say the piece was in D minor, but you would look for two horns in D, probably, and then two horns in F. But if you didn't have four horns available, well, then they would probably tend to go more for the, uh, for the horns in F, because they would have more notes in common. Horns are what we call transposing instruments, which means that apart from the horn in C, the high horn in C, which sounds as written, we have to allow for the fact that if we're taking a horn in F, well, if I play this C, written C, what's going to come out of the instrument is the F below it. If I play a horn in B flat, which will usually be the low B flat, again, if this C is written, well, this will be the B flat that sounds. Um, an octave and a whole tone, a whole ninth below that original note. Finally, not only is the horn limited in the number of notes it can play, but it can't play really, well, it can, I mean players can play these semi-quaver passages, but they don't really sound very good on the instrument. And the instrument sounds very good when it's playing either very long sustaining notes 
or playing signals. So we can really use the horn for the, what I was talking about in the other talks with, with what I call the rhythm of the piece for, certain, for setting certain signals for underlining and for highlighting certain moments. Let's take a closer look at, the, at how, we are, how this looks now in the score. actually possible with this type of horn and what was the normal day-to-day -day occurrence, the best place to look is in the four concertos of Mozart. Look at what he wrote for the solo horn player and then look in those same pieces to see what the tutti, what the orchestral horn players were being asked to do. Now we're still talking about this two-part invention of Bach and now we're going to expand it further still um, we're just taking the material we had with the Haydn Orchestra and we're going to extend it, first of all, to the type of orchestra that Beethoven might have used and then to the end of the 19th century to the type of orchestra that Brahms or Dvořák might have seen. Now let's start with Beethoven and the first, person, the first people to consider are the people who have joined us. So we have new are two flutes, two clarinets, two trumpets and the timpani. Now, how do we use these? I intend to keep all the material that I've had up till now in the Haydn Orchestra, so there's going to be something new now happening. The most important thing is that I can now set the woodwind independently, because I don't have to have them just highlighting the strings as they were with the Haydn Orchestra. The next thing I must know is what the flute can and can't do. The flute is in a big ensemble, very weak in its lower octave, and so it tends to be used really just in this, particularly from this C, that's the, uh, the C above middle C, up to the G above, uh, an octave and a half above that. That tends to be the best range for the flute in the, in the complete ensemble. If it's playing solo, of course it can be very, very sensual in this lower octave as well. Clarinets are transposing instruments, but I intend to talk about all the transposing instruments in another talk. So in this number we shall be just having clarinets in B-flat, and they can be used to replace the oboes, changing the colour a little bit. Trumpets have to be uh, used very, very carefully. We don't use too much of them, or they can dominate everything and drown everything else out. But they can be used very effectively for highlighting, as Beethoven usually did. Again, we have two of these, and finally the timpani, again, somebody who should not be used too often, but very, very good for highlighting. Okay, we have an independent woodwind band that can just carry the melody without the strings at all, so that can be used in contrast with the strings. And we also have um, the cello and bass, can be separated, as we've already done, but now we can make more of a point of that, as Beethoven did.
we can move on to the end of the 19th century, to the type of orchestra that Brahms and Dvorak would have been using, particularly Dvorak, who very much liked his, his uh, triple wind, as we call it. And this means, in addition to the two flutes you already have with Beethoven, you'll have a piccolo, you'll have, uh, in addition to the two oboes, you'll have an English horn, or cor anglais, and then in addition to the clarinets, you'll have a bass clarinet, and the third member of the bassoon family is the contrabassoon, sounding an octave lower than written. Now we don't want to overload our orchestration, so that all of these instruments that we've now added should be used for highlighting, not all the way through the whole number. And um, we have two more horns, we have three trombones, and there's something now to be said about them as well, because they tend to be written in alto and tenor clef, the upper two, the bass trombone will be written in a bass clef. Again, the subject of clefs I'll be dealing with a light transposing instrument in another talk. Finally, we add cymbals and a bass drum, and I, of course you won't need me to tell you that these have to be used very sparingly, otherwise we can get very tired of them. So these are the instruments I use for highlighting, uh, the Beethoven Orchestra is perfectly up to the job of carrying the whole business and giving us a lot of different colours as well. But of course, now that we have all these extra instruments at our disposal, we can really have some little splashes of colour all over the place. <laughs>